Bible with you, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that is where we'll be beginning our study tonight. It's where we're going to spend the majority of our time this evening. So if you've got your Bible, be opening up there as we consider what the Holy Spirit through Paul has to say to us about marriage, whether we are presently in marriage, whether we are looking at some day to be married, or whether we are simply existing around people who themselves one day will be making the decision to get married and we hope to be a positive influence on their lives. Thank you for being here this evening. We have visitors again with us and we're very thankful that you're here and if you can stick around a little while after services so that we can get to know you a little bit better, we sure would appreciate that. If you have been keeping up with our Read Through the New Testament in Six Months plan, uh, you wrapped up 1 Corinthians this past week. As you well know, we were supposed to be in chapter 15 this morning. That didn't happen. We'll save that for next week. But uh, this evening, we do want to consider uh, some of what we see, and I say 1 Corinthians 6 on the uh, screen, and that is not at all correct because we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, so just ignore that, that chapter 6. That's absolutely wrong. As we're looking at what the Holy Spirit says to us here about marriage, there are going to be some moments here where in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul speaks about issues that Jesus himself did speak about, and he's going to address a few scenarios in specific that Jesus did not address while he was here in his earthly ministry. He is going to be answering some questions that had been posed to him, that is Paul, uh, by the Corinthian church, and that really sets the framework for what we're going to see here in chapter 7. Place your marker or a finger there in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I want you to jump back with me very, very quickly to one passage in John's gospel account. Look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16 and verse 12. John 16 and verse 12 as we get started looking at what the Apostle Paul would write to Christians about marriage and about wisdom as it is related to marriage. In John 16 and verse 12, it is Jesus who is speaking. Speaking to his apostles, Paul is not yet an apostle. He will become one in the book of Acts. But speaking to his apostles, Jesus says this in verse 12 of John 16, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. Now notice verse 14, he shall glorify me, Jesus says, because he will take of what is mine and disclose it to you. Jesus was leaving. Jesus is going to Calvary in the next chapter in John's gospel account. Jesus is telling his apostles, I have more things I wish I could say to you because you are the ones who are going to take the gospel into the whole world. But I am leaving. However, I am sending the Holy Spirit to you. And he, verse 13, is going to guide you, apostles, into all truth. So the message that you are proclaiming is not going to be dependent upon yourself, but upon the Holy Spirit who is inspiring you. And then verse 14, the Holy Spirit would not be creating this message up on his own. Jesus says, he, the Spirit, will glorify me because he will take of what is mine and disclose it to you. And so when the apostles would set about their business of sharing the gospel throughout the whole world, yes, it was the Spirit who was inspiring them to write and to speak whatever it was they were saying and writing, but the message that the Spirit was inspiring them with was a message that ultimately originated with whom? With Jesus. And so when we read Peter in the New Testament, when we read Paul in the New Testament, while those letters may not be in red in our Bibles because they did not explicitly come from the mouth of Jesus, they are no less important because ultimately they do come from Jesus. It is his message that the apostles were sharing. Now, all of that being said, that framework being laid down, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which begins this way, and this is an interesting way to begin. He says, now concerning... The things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That's an interesting way to begin a chapter, isn't it? All right? Um, 
If you highlight in your Bible, you might highlight chapter 7 and verse 1 and that phrase, now concerning. You might also note that in chapter 7 and verse 25, you have a similar construction. Now concerning, he says, virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as one who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. If you move over into chapter 8, you're going to see that same phrase, chapter 8 and verse 1, now concerning. You're going to see another now concerning statement in chapter 8 and verse 4. Uh, As you go through the rest of 1 Corinthians, you will see a now concerning statement at chapter 12 and verse 1. And then you will see a now concerning statement in chapter 15 and verse 12, perhaps. And then you will see one in chapter 16 and verse 1. Uh, The the reason I bring all that out to you, this is, we we call it 1 Corinthians. This is not going to be confusing at all. We call it 1 Corinthians, but it's really not 1 Corinthians, okay? Because Paul is writing back to the Corinthians as they had written him, uh, perhaps about a letter, 1 Corinthians 5 seems to indicate, that he had written to them previously. So what we call 1 Corinthians... It's actually probably 2 Corinthians. What we call 2 Corinthians is probably 3 Corinthians. We're going to be referring to it like that throughout the rest of the sermon, 2 and 3 Corinthians. No, we're not, so don't worry. Okay. But when Paul is writing them and he uses this now concerning language in 1 Corinthians, this is Paul responding to questions that had been written to him by the Corinthians. You see that, right? Chapter 7 and verse 1. Now concerning the things about which you wrote. We don't have their questions, but we have the answers, so we get to play a game of Jeopardy, right? We have the answers, and we're trying to figure out what the questions were. Uh, So at least two questions here in chapter 7, something about a man and it not being good for a man to, or it being good for a man not to touch a woman. Got that backwards. That was almost really bad. And chapter 7 and verse 25, a a command concerning uh, virgins. So what were their questions here? Obviously, it had something to do with marriage. That's the entire context here in chapter 7. So something of their questions had to do with marriage. Perhaps the first question is this, Paul, you're not married. And so should we be like you, Paul? Should we be like you? Should we all make it our goal to be unmarried? Paul is going to talk about the blessings of being unmarried in in his unique state. But notice his answer, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, let each man have his own wife and each woman have her own husband. He'll develop that thought more, but he's at least saying that, no, that's not necessarily the point I was trying to make, Paul says. And then there's another question over here in chapter 7 and verse 25, well, Paul, if if it's good to be married, does that mean that everyone must pursue marriage? In chapter 7 and verse 25, as he is giving instructions to those who are virgins, meaning, I think in this text, those who are unmarried, he is going to counsel them about the wisdom or perhaps lack of wisdom of marriage in that current cultural climate. Because of what he says in verse 26, I think then that it is good in view of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Perhaps those were the questions that were asked. And Paul proceeds to answer them here in chapter 7. But whether or not we know the explicit questions, we do know the answers that Paul provided. And we know that there is wisdom here because these messages aren't originating with Paul. They're from the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit received them from Christ himself. This is the mind of Christ that we have before us. And so as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, what is it that we can learn about marriage? How can we better equip ourselves for marriage? If we are in marriages, how can we make our marriages stronger and more robust? And if we are simply interacting with those who are married, how can we help them to make sure that their marriages are marriages that glorify God and accomplish the purpose that He intended for them? Let's start in verses 1 and 2 where Paul says it is good for a man not to touch a woman but because of immoralities let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Perhaps we should start here in 1 Corinthians and make this note that marriage is the only relationship for sexual activity. Right? We, we live in a world today that just encourages the, the concept of you do whatever makes you feel good, whatever makes you happy. 
Uh, marriage has basically been thrown in the garbage. You, you live with somebody. If you want to continue living with them, that's fantastic. And if you don't, well, then just leave them and go and find whatever makes you happy. Standing in stark contrast to that, that was the biblical perspective of marriage that has one man and one woman joined together for one lifetime. And within the confines of that marriage relationship is where the sexual relationship is to be found. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. But because of immoralities, verse 2, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Paul speaks very frankly about marriage and sex here, doesn't he? It's almost a refreshing candor compared to some of the mores and how, how our Western society tends to treat, or has at least in the past, treated the idea of marriage and sex. Paul, Paul fully recognizes one fundamental aspect of marriage is a sexual relationship. And that within many there is this natural drive to sexual activity. And that to express that desire must be within the context of marriage. Let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. You know, this passage would also speak about ideas that tend to float around every now and then about polygamy, right? Whether polygamy by polygyny or polygamy by polyandry, multiple husbands or, or multiple wives. You would notice chapter 7 and verse 2 would speak to that idea, wouldn't it? Let each woman have her own husband, singular, and each husband have his own wife, singular, right? We are talking marriage as defined by God here is one man and one woman in a relationship that is intended to last for the lifetime of both spouses. So marriage, as we see it here, is the only relationship for sexual activity. And so should that drive for sexual activity become high within us, should we fear that we are going to fulfill this in some ungodly way, one thing we perhaps ought to look for is what? Marriage. Now. Is that the only consideration for marriage? And the answer that every parent would tell their child is what? No. No. Right? I can remember my mom counseling me from the time that I was 14 or 15 years old and looking at those who were getting married uh, around us, and she'd always make uh, some point along the lines of, well, you can't get by on just love. I, th I, think, I, I think I understand a little bit more now what, what she meant by that, right? That we need to have love in our marriages, absolutely. Absolutely. But is marriage about more than simply companionship? And are trials in marriage much greater than simply whether or not we, we spend time together and get along with each other and whether we are the apple of each other's eyes? Well, certainly we ought to be that. But there's more to marriage and more challenges that we're going to face than just that. So we start here that marriage is the only relationship for sexual activity, but continue on here. Look at verses 3 and 4 to that end then. If we opt for marriage, which we do not have to opt for marriage, correct? We don't have to be married. But if we choose to be married, we need to understand verses 3 and 4 that marriage brings with it responsibilities. If you choose to be married, that is wonderful and well and good. But we need to have our eyes open that entering into marriage, that brings certain responsibilities with it. There are a host of responsibilities that we could talk about. We could talk about Ephesians chapter 5 and the relationship of husbands and wives and wives to husbands and moms and dads to children and children to parents. We could talk about all of that. But you will notice in the context of 1 Corinthians 7, that's not what's brought up, is it? That wasn't the problem at Corinth. The problem at Corinth perhaps more closely resembles our society today in some ways. But if we opt for marriage, we need to understand that marriage brings some responsibilities with it. And one of those responsibilities that marriage brings with it uh, is the responsibility, if we can say it that way, the responsibility of sexual activity. One blessing of the marriage relationship is sexual activity, but that is also a responsibility of the marriage relationship. Look at verses 3 and 4. 
Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife. And I will try not to be as graphic uh, in this. I understand we got little ears in here. Perhaps your Bible has a heading there, uh, conjugal duties or something like that. That just makes it seem so bare and uh, uncomfortable, doesn't it? Uh, But verse 3, let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Perhaps we, had, we would have a lot of people in first century society shaking their heads along with that. Yes, Paul, preach it, brother, and you go. But then look, look at the latter half of verse 4. Any ideas th- that we might have today that Paul was a misogynist, uh, that Paul was a chauvinist, that, that Paul was setting men on a pedestal and keeping women under his thumb, any idea like that is completely eviscerated when you come to the second half of verse 4 and Paul says this to women who lived in Corinth in the first century and the husband does not have authority over his own body but the wife does. I understand it's in vogue sometimes to bash Paul and to say he's this and he's that but whatever we're going to say about Paul needs to be consistent with what Paul actually said. And what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 4 is that the wife belongs to the husband, but what goes right along with that is what? The husband belongs to the wife. That was a notion that would find quick rejection in much of the culture, much of the Roman culture in the first century. But this is the very ethic to which Christians are called. In marriage, my body belongs to my spouse and my spouse's body belongs to me. What does that then do to the marriage relationship? Remember Ephesians chapter 5? No man ever harms his own body, but he nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church. Love does no harm to a brother. We think about all of the principles that in in the Bible that speak to us about how we take care of ourselves. And well, if if my body not only belongs to me, but my spouse belongs to me as well, all of those passages then start to come into focus. This is not, and, and we need to understand this, this is not Paul slavishly saying that a wife belongs to her husband and she must fulfill his every whim and every fantasy and that the husband belongs to the wife and he must fulfill her every wish and her every fantasy. I hope we recognize that's not the point to set up some sort of slavish relationship here. But it is to say that there is a unity that is expressed in marriage and a unity that has to be appreciated. And that there is a fundamental care in marriage that I look at my spouse and I treat my spouse as though I am treating myself. It's it's thoughtfulness. It's genuineness. It is compassion and concern. Those are the ideas here. The marriage relationship brings with it responsibility. Think about one practical way this might manifest itself in in relationships today. A lot of folks my age like video games. I cannot begin to tell you how many marriages of, of younger people, marriages that have ended up on the rocks because husbands before they were married liked to play video games. And they come into the marriage and nothing changes. And so with all of their free time, instead of focusing and spending time with their wife and, and, and treating their wife as though she is a part of his life, he just sits down in front of the PlayStation or the Xbox or his computer and plays games all of his free time. That's immaturity in a marriage. That's immaturity as it relates to my spouse. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4, talks to us about responsibilities that come with marriage. If as a man I think I'm getting into marriage and all that I'm getting is a second mom who's going to clean up after me and bring me food and things like that, I'm sorely mistaken. And that idea needs to change. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. Stop depriving one another, Paul says. Except by agreement. 
Now that, that perhaps is a phrase we don't expect here. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by way of concession and not of command. Let's think through this very carefully. Let's word this very carefully. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5. In marriage, you can take a break. But we've got to be careful. What do we mean by take a break? All right? Read that again. Stop depriving one another. All right? We're still in this very um, this context of marriage in which Paul is especially talking about the, some of the physical aspects of marriage. And he says, stop depriving one another, right? We should never use sex as a tool in our marriages. It's never a tool to deprive somebody, to shame somebody, something like that. That's never how sex is presented to us in the New Testament. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time. So that you may devote yourselves to prayer. And come together again, lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. When we talk about a break here, he's not talking about a break from marriage, right? As if we can go out and be joined to somebody else. Certainly that's not the idea here. But there is this idea that, that perhaps our physical aspect of our relationship may have overtaken other parts of the relationship. Maybe it has begun to um, perhaps obscure what our true purpose is here on the earth. And so the call is that we may, for a moment, deprive one another by agreement. So notice here, uh, the first thing he says is that this must be with consent. I, as one party in marriage, can't decide, you know what, we're just not going to have a sexual relationship anymore and you've got to be okay with that and there we go. That's wrong. That's wrong. Perhaps we need to say in the interest of fairness, the other side of that coin would be wrong too. To force a spouse into sexual activity when that spouse is not prepared for it, is not ready for it, is, is not able or is not comfortable with it. And there could be a whole lot of reasons why. This goes back to verses 2, 3, and 4 and the responsibilities that go with marriage and things like that. But number one, that this period of, of depriving, as it's called here, has to be with consent. Keep reading. Except by agreement for a time. For a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. This break, if you call it that in verse 5, is, is for the purpose of a spiritual focus. This isn't, hey, I saw a, a, another lady in town and she's looking pretty fine and so we're just going to take a break. for. No. That's not the biblical idea at all. That makes a mockery of marriage. It's for the purpose of spiritual focus. And it is done with an end date in mind. Did you catch that there in, in, the, the, in the middle of verse 5? Except by agreement for a time. Uh, that is, th this is not an indefinite, we're on hiatus uh, sexually un until such a time as, as I feel that you're worthy or such a time as I feel this or that or whatever it might be. There's an end date in mind and that it is ended by a full reunion, right? The end of verse 5 there, and come together again lest Satan tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Verse 6 and adds in, I say this by way of concession and not as a command and that may tie into verse 7 or it may tie into verse 5 here and that is there may never come a moment in our marriage where we need to have this sort of a break but if our marriage has come to that point this is an option that is available to us but let's make sure we understand this is a passage that has been abused in the past this passage is not about granting a right for divorce nor is it about granting a right for something less than divorce but looks a whole lot like divorce. It's not what this passage is talking about, is it? Come with me then to verses 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. This I say by way of concession, not of command, yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. Well, what was Paul? He was single. Paul's going to explain his reasoning why. Why? 
But then he's going to recognize not everyone has that same ethic that Paul had, that same drive. However, verse 7, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them to remain even as I am. But if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. And we need to understand that he's talking there about burning with self-control. He's not talking about burning in hell. That's an awkward uh, construction there that some, some have taken. Verse 10, but to the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. We need to think carefully before getting married. Before we ever stand in front of the preacher or the judge or whomever and exchange our vows and put rings on each other's fingers and sign papers and make promises, it's the big one, and make promises to one another, we need to think carefully before we ever stand in that position. We need to realize, as Paul says there in verses 6, 7, and 8, that there is a certain blessing in being single. Right? It's not something that is for everybody, but there is a certain blessing in it. You look at the life that Paul describes that he led at the end of 2 Corinthians, right? Being shipwrecked, being stoned, being imprisoned, being hungry, being thirsty, being abandoned, also... Is that the environment that a man should be bringing his wife and children into? Certainly not. Paul, I think, recognized that, which is why Paul never pursued a spouse. Right? There are some things that we might be able to do more freely if we don't have a spouse. That's something we might need to consider, something we do need to consider before we get married. But that being said, we need to realize that marriage can help with self-control. That is, marriage is not the solution to self-control. But there is within many a very natural desire for sexual activity. And God has provided a realm in which that is to be fulfilled. And so if I am struggling with that desire, there is a realm in which it can be fulfilled, and that is marriage. And in some way, then, marriage can help with self-control. That is the point in verse 9. If they do not have self-control as it relates to the sexual drive, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. But then taking what we said earlier in verses 4 and 5 about marriage having responsibilities and thinking carefully before marriage, that then brings us logically to verse 10 that says what? To the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. I cannot walk away from my marriage. Underline that, highlight it, dog ear the page, whatever you need to do. If I am somebody who is looking at marriage, or if I am counseling those who are married, or if I am in my own marriage, I need to confront the reality that God does not give me the right to just stand up one day and leave it all behind. I cannot simply walk away from my marriage. Give me an amen, Sam. Thank you. I can't walk away from my marriage. Now look at verses 10, 11, and 12 with me. Sam, I put you on the spot. Thank you, brother. To the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. But if she does leave, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not send his wife away. Do you notice there in verses 10 and 11, the husband and wife are both commanded the thing they are not to do, right? Don't divorce your husband, don't send your wife away. The concepts there are synonymous. But then we see, maybe in my Bible it is, maybe it is in yours and well, verse 11 has a parenthetical statement. There in parentheses, but if she does leave, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And so someone would say, well, isn't Paul giving the option in here in chapter 7 and verse 11 uh, of divorce to somebody just as long as they commit to remaining unmarried? Could, Audrey's not in here right now, so I'll pick on Audrey real quick. Could Audrey just decide, hey, Tyler's bald. He's much balder than he was when we got married. Uh, he's hairy, he sweats, and so uh, I don't like any of that, and I'm gone. Does she have that right? 
because of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11. If she does, verse 11, if she does leave, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. Let's, let's give this just a little bit of thought. Go back to verse 10. To the married I give instruction, not I but the Lord. What Paul is saying here is a repeating of what Jesus had said. Paul is saying, I'm not telling you anything that Jesus hasn't told you already. Let me show that to you. Two passages. Look over with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. In verse 2, a Pharisee comes to Jesus and tests him and asks, is it lawful for a man to divorce a wife? What's Jesus' answer? His answer is in verse 9 of Mark chapter 10. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So answer the question for me. Can a man divorce his wife? Jesus' answer in Mark 10 is what? What God has joined together, let no man separate. What's the answer? No. Now, we need to make sure we get a well-rounded picture. Look at Matthew chapter 19, where this same moment is recorded, but Matthew supplies us through the Holy Spirit just a little bit more detail. We find out that the question was a little bit more explicit than simply, can a man divorce his wife? As Matthew records it, the question is this, verse 3, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? She burned the toast. That is the example going back for hundreds of years, right? How long have people been eating toast? I don't know. She burned the toast. But why is it always her? He burned the toast. How about that? He burned the toast. Can she send him away? All right. Jesus is going to give the same answer, isn't he? Verse 6, what God has joined together, let no man separate. But then Jesus gives just a little bit more detail. He focuses on one specific scenario, a specific scenario that Luke doesn't focus on, that Mark doesn't focus on, but Jesus does here in Matthew's account. I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for the cause of sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. That is, Jesus seems to indicate there is one reason, one reason why a man or a woman may, with God's sanction, divorce his or her spouse. And what is that one reason? Sexual immorality. But if sexual immorality has not occurred, what principle do we fall back on? What God has joined together, let no man separate. Take that understanding then and come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11, where Paul says this, To the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband. Why? Because the two are what? One flesh and what God has joined together, let no man separate. So that's what we're operating from. That's, that's the, the, the foundation from which we're operating. Uh, in the verse immediately before, verse 11 to verse 10, Paul refuses divorce, doesn't he? Verse 10 says, do not leave your husband. In verse 11, husbands are not to send away their wives. I would submit to you then that it seems inconsistent and unlikely that in the very next verse, the Holy Spirit would undo, if we can use that language, what he just said in verse 10. That doesn't make a, a whole lot of sense, would it? If the Holy Spirit would tell us, don't divorce, but then says, okay, you can divorce, and then comes back at the very end of verse 11 and says what? Don't divorce doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense could i submit to you rather that what is happening here in verse 11 in that parenthetical statement is paul is expressing what a christian should do who happens to find him or herself in that position that is paul is not offering an exception here but what he is doing is simply addressing a real life scenario let me give you a perfect example of this in your new testament look at first john chapter 2 look at first john chapter 2 and verse 1, where you have this uh, almost identical grammatical construction. 
First John chapter 2 and verse 1, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that we may not sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He himself is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, also for those of the whole world. Verse 1 there. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Okay? But here comes our similar grammatical construction. But if anyone does sin, that's the same as 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 11. In 1 John 2 and verse 1, is, is John giving permission for Christians to sin? Obviously not. We understand that, don't we? What is he doing? He's addressing the scenario wherein a Christian has sinned. Is that the ideal? Is that what God wants? Is that what God calls it? Does God call us to sin? Of course not. So then we're just dealing with life as we confront it, right? If we do sin, if this happens to happen, if this happens to occur, here's what we are to do. But if we do sin... We have an advocate with the Father. Now take that understanding back here to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11. If she does leave, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. You, you look at what is said here in 1 Corinthians. You had people who had been in mixed religious marriages. You had people who had been divorced and remarried who were coming to Christ. And some of them are looking at the relationships from which they came out of and are realizing my relationship that I came out of, that's not what it should have been. So how do you fix that? Well, if upon learning the truth, 1 Corinthians seven eleven, I realize that I'm wrongfully divorced, I've got two options. I'm to seek reconciliation with my former spouse, or I am to remain single. But the point here in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 11 is not giving the Christian an option to divorce a spouse for a cause less than sexual immorality. Because notice verse 10 and the end of verse 11. Paul is saying, don't leave. The Holy Spirit is saying, don't leave. In that parenthetical in verse 11, he explains to us how to handle if something like that has happened already. Then he comes back at the end of verse 11 and emphasizes again, don't do what? Don't leave. Don't divorce your spouse. For Christians, for those who have read what Jesus has taught, divorce is off the table unless sexual immorality has occurred. That's how we need to approach it because that's how the architect of marriage laid it out for us. There is a devotion to each other that comes about with that sort of a mindset. And gracious, I understand it is 550 already. We're not going to go through all of the different scenarios and all of the different tricky complications that come up and, and when fornication occurred and, and this and that. And I understand that there are difficult decisions out there. I get that. And I am not a fan of working through different divorce permutations in the pulpit. I don't think that does a whole lot of good for much of anybody. Except to say we have to absolutely affirm what is absolutely affirmed in Scripture. And I know the good people of this church would stand right beside me and saying that same thing. I understand that congregations have to make decisions on these matters. And we have to make these decisions with the best available information that's before us. And if we sadly find ourselves personally in these sorts of situations, we have to make these sorts of decisions with the best information that comes before us. I get that. But we never need to make those decisions individually or congregationally. when that decision would be in clear violation of what Scripture teaches. Don't divorce your spouse is the guiding rule, isn't it? Why? Because God has joined together the two. And what God has joined together, man should not separate. And so, that leads us to the conclusion in verses 12 through 15 that we need to choose our spouse carefully, don't we? We need to think about this. We need to think about who we're going to marry. We need to, as older people, be able to offer our wise counsel to those who are younger, who are 
seeking marriage or who one day will be seeking marriage. We need to be able to think through these issues consistently, logically, and biblically. For example, marriage to a non-Christian is not forbidden. 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 15, it does not forbid marriage to a non-Christian. But the Holy Spirit is just as quickly going to note to us that that marriage can be especially challenging. Right? We need to be forthright with our children and our young people. Gracious, even our older people who might be looking to remarry, we need to be honest and open and forthright about these things, right? But marriage to a non-Christian. Look, full disclosure. Raise your hand. I'm not, I don't often do this, but I'll, I'll let you do it if you're brave enough to do it. Raise your hand if you have never had a problem in your marriage. There's not a hand that is, there's not a hand that is up. Right? Put that down real quick. <laughs> that does not mean that marriage is bad, but it does mean that there are tough times in marriage, aren't, aren't there? Uh, aren't there? There are tough times in marriages. There we go. We'll get it grammatically fixed. You know what helps marriage? When you got two people coming from the same background, a background that they have both chosen for themselves, a background of following Jesus, that helps. Right? It's not a sin to marry a non-Christian, but we need to have our eyes open that that can be especially challenging because marriage is challenging at times. We need to remember, ultimately, that our allegiance must be to God. Verse 15, yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The scenario Paul has laid out here is one where, where an unbelieving spouse comes to the believing spouse and says, you either leave God or I'm leaving you. The question is, am I, am I a slave to the marriage at that point? Do I have to leave God because my husband or wife told me to leave God? And the answer in verse 15 is, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. My ultimate allegiance, even in marriage, must be to God. And to wrap this all up, we need to remember the priority in marriage. Marriage was giving for man's benefit, wasn't it? God saw that it was not good that man was alone, so he created a helper that was suitable for him. One of the fundamental concepts of marriage is the idea of companionship and the idea of help. And so you come to verse 16, for how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner let him walk, and thus I direct in all the churches. Circumcision, verse 19, is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing, but what matters is keeping the commandments of God. Who knows what we are able to accomplish? But here's the goal, verse 16, is seeing my family saved. Seeing my spouse, my husband, my wife, seeing them being saved. That's the ultimate goal. And if our marriages are not working towards that goal of seeing our household being saved, then something in our marriages needs to change. I appreciate your good attention tonight. I appreciate working with a congregation that not only tolerates this kind of preaching, but expects this kind of preaching. And you expect it because it's biblical, because it's part of God's will. And that's what we're seeking to do here at University Oaks. We're trying to live out God's will in our lives as individuals and as a church. I appreciate your concern for the things of God. If you look at your life this evening and you're outside of a relationship with God, if you haven't been living as you should. You've got a wonderful opportunity this evening to change, to make things right. If perhaps you're not a Christian and you're ready to respond to the Lord's invitation of salvation, to be washed in His blood in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins, and to raise to walk in new life, we're ready to help you do that. Maybe as a Christian you look at your life and you haven't been living as you should and you want to make a change. You want to repent. We want to help you repent. We want to pray for you and encourage you. If we can help you respond to the gospel in any way tonight, would you come while we stand and while we